I thought to myself that all of what I'm going to say is abundantly available in literature, books, articles, whatever, on our website and other websites. So frankly, I didn't see the need. But as they say, I bowed down to the demand placed on me so much so that Sri Lekha ma'am has taken the additional opportunity of fixing what you see here, this contraption. To what end, I am not very sure, but anyway. I know what she intends to do, but let's hope that you know it comes out well. So, with your permission, may I start? Is this a fair, first of all, let me ask you, is this something that some of you, not all of you, some of you may have wanted to know? There are some heads that are nodding, so I'm sure they're probably, as I said, others have to suffer in silence. So anyway, so this is, I'm not sure whether this is a, is this a cherry blossom tree? Is it? It is not cherry blossom. Anyway, Shomnath is, I must thank him because he got very enthused by the whole prospect, so he sided with those who wanted to know, I think, and he's put up this presentation. So, largely what you see is thanks to him. All right? So, uh, this first part is, I've called it the work of Sri Aurobindo the mother, instead of calling it the philosophy. Because philosophy sounds very drab, it's thinking. This is work. Okay? So, let's proceed. Now, on the first slide is something that you already know. It's... Um, but I've culled it from the last speech that Sri Aurobindo purportedly gave. Why do I say purportedly gave? Because he did not speak. Sri Aurobindo's voice, as you know, is not recorded anywhere. It was not permitted to be recorded. Uh, he had a good voice, which is described, but there was no tape recording done. This was um, broadcast on the 15th of August 1947 on the day of India's independence from All India Radio Trichinopoli. All right? You must remember that Trichinopoli was in British India and Pondicherry achieved independence only in 1954, seven years later. So hence the significance of AIR Trichinopoli. I've just taken, he's talked about five dreams there. So I will just take you very briefly in a nutshell through those five dreams. The first he talked about was a dream of a free and united India. It was important to talk about it that day because that was the day of India's birth as a nation. All right. Never before in history had India ever been free in the sense that it became free on the 15th of August, 1947. Because as a nation, this geography was never there. Right from Ashoka and thereafter, this was not the map of India. This was born out of what British India became and then later followed. But nevertheless, as you all know and now realize, being part of this institution, that India achieved her independence on Sri Aurobindo's 75th birthday. And Sri Aurobindo described it not as a mere coincidence, but as something that Providence had probably laid out. All right? That was his description. Now comes the second part. He talked about a free and united India in his speech he very much deplored, he was sad by the state of the affairs in the country, that millions of people were crossing from India into the newborn nation of Pakistan, and millions were crossing from Pakistan into India. All right? Now, what I have put up here on this slide is a photograph of the mother, taken actually much later, in front of the flag, or not the flag, the map of what Sri Aurobindo and the mother thought should be the map of United India. All right? When we talk about United India, I have a note of caution, which Sri Aurobindo himself has said in his message of 15th August. He is not talking of political unity. He is not saying that you must forcibly occupy countries and make them one. But he felt that these, the portions of this particular landmass, 
must not be bitterly opposed to each other. Because if you are bitterly opposed, then of course there is fratricide, you don't live together in harmony, etc., etc. And to develop, as is very common knowledge, even the South Asian Charter, the Sark Charter says that, that for the development of all the people in this subcontinent, a peaceful coexistence is important. Sri Aurobindo said more than that. He actually said that if India remains partitioned, it will never achieve its true destiny. So to achieve India's destiny, not only economically, not only politically, not only culturally, but in every which way it has to play its proper role on the world stage, India's civilizational map, if I would talk, it about, talk about it like that, must look like this. Even today, you will find in the newspapers that in Palmyra, in the Middle East, one more monument is in ruins. Another civilizational module is ending. So therefore, if this civilization has to be preserved, it has to deliver to the world then the map of India, the civilizational map of India, not necessarily the political map, needs to look like this. And this is what has been put out out here, all right? What you may not see here is also Sri Lanka because it's obscured by the, the chair there. So actually, this includes Myanmar, Nepal, Bhutan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and of course, India. The landmass that we now call Sark. So actually, a beginning has been made. If you draw a parallel, Sark one day could resemble the European Union, could. And a beginning has been made this year with the signing of a transit treaty between Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, and Nepal for easier road access and port access through some of the eastern neighbors. Some rail links are being planned, etc. So it's in that direction, but we are very, very far. Every day's newspaper or every six months, there's firing across the Indo-Pakistan border, there's terrorism from one source or the other, etc., etc. And Sri Aurobindo had predicted it. In fact, on the 15th of August or thereabouts, um, in 47-48, in a letter to Dilip Kumar Roy, he mentioned that he was not sure what India would do with her independence. And he talked about Gundaraj, he talked about corruption, he talked about hooliganism, all the kinds of things that have actually beset Indian society since. All right. So he was not sure what India would do with her independence, but nevertheless, this is it. So this is the United India. Now, this is what we commonly call the mother's flag in our, in our uh, institution. But this has also been described by Sri Aurobindo as the flag of a potentially united India. So when we hoist this flag, we are pinning our hopes that one day, Indian civilization might come together. All right? Okay. The second dream that Sri Aurobindo had, he talked about the resurgence and liberation of the peoples of Asia. At the time Sri Aurobindo said it, it must have seemed like a wild dream. But 70 years down the line, almost 70 years down the line, I think we are talking about when the 21st century being Asia's century, all right? It's a century that will not only be occupied by India, but also by China, by Sri Lanka, by uh, Hong Kong, by Japan, by Indonesia, all right, by the Philippines. There's a lot of talk about this part of the world making rapid strides, but that was Sri Aurobindo's second dream. And he mentioned it, that it is beginning. All right, so the resurgence and liberation of the peoples of Asia. So it was not just Asia as a landmass, but the peoples of Asia would see a massive change in their lifestyle. All right, that was his dream. And indeed, you see that. You see that the life of Chinese people have metamorphosed in these last years since 1949 till today, particularly since the 1970s, China, the, the life of the average Chinese has metamorphosed completely. In India, quality of life is significantly improved from what our forefathers saw. 
Same is the story with Indonesia, same is the story with some other developing nations, same is the story with Vietnam, etc. All right. The third thing he talked about, his third dream was of a world union, forming the outer basis of a fairer, brighter, and nobler life for all mankind. Now, this still remains a dream. In one of his books, uh, which is commonly clubbed together as social and political thought, but which has three sections, one called human cycle, one called ideal of human unity, one called war and self-determination. Sri Aurobindo has extensively dwelt on the importance of the League of Nations, which was first born, and then the importance of a more durable entity, in this case, the United Nations, which was born towards the end of his life. All right? So therefore, he talked about that in great detail, but when he says that a world union forming the outer basis, he was very careful, outer basis of a, of a fairer, brighter, and nobler life for all mankind, the mother in 1968 gave, how would I say, gave body to that vision of his, all right? and in a place 10 kilometers from Pondicherry called Oroville. Here you see is the is Matri Mandir, which has no images, no idols, no nothing. It's an empty thing inside. You just climb into an artificially made thing into the top and an inner chamber where light from a crystal comes or light from sunlight comes and falls in a crystal and gets reflected. And there is a complete sense of peace. When I ask the children who visit Oroville and Matri Mandir, children from our school, for instance, they say that, you know, I, I asked, I think last year or year before, I landed up in Pondicherry Station the day Satya and his group were leaving back for Calcutta and asked the kids who had been to Oroville, what did you feel when you went to Oroville? One child told me, I didn't know that silence is the voice. So, you know, it's, it's, and, and it was echo. They, you concretely feel that silence has a voice. So that is a feeling, it's called Matri Mandir or the Sanctuary of Truth. And on the right side is uh, an urn surround, you know, in the same complex as the Matri Mandir, which has in that urn got the soil of 128 nations of the world. This, when it got started, was a UNESCO project. And UNESCO, you know, it's a project to actually conceive of that particular third dream of Sri Aurobindo. All right? So let's see now what Oroville intends to be. It's a nucleus of that world union which hopes to be born one day. So this is the Oroville Charter. And Oroville Charter is something written by the mother. And it says, Oroville belongs to nobody in particular. Oroville belongs to humanity as a whole. Now, there's an essential contradiction because Oroville is part of the political entity called India. But he's, she's saying, Oroville belongs to humanity as a whole. But to live in Oroville, one must be a willing servitor of the divine consciousness. That means, you don't need to be a national of a particular country, but you must be a willing servitor of what she calls the divine consciousness. Oroville will, the play, will be the place of an unending education. And I'll just take, mention one little anecdote or a little thing to you. When I first visited Oroville, uh, not first, but one of my first visits, I went to the two schools that were there. And the mother had named one of them the last school, and another one after school. Both were schools, but they were called the last school, and the second one was called after school. Oroville will be the place of an unending education of constant progress and a youth that never ages. In fact, you might have heard here, those of you who've heard uh, mother's voice on, on tape on this, this particular thing, on her 90th birthday, she's talking of the importance of being young. You know, in spirit and if possible in body. Oroville wants to be the bridge between the past and the future, taking advantage of all discoveries from without and from within. Oroville will boldly spring towards future realizations. 
Oroville will be a site of material and spiritual researches for a living embodiment of an actual human unity. So that dream of Sri Aurobindo, which he had written about and which was one of his third dreams, is the, the, the place, the nucleus of that dream is in Oroville and hopefully one day you'll see across the world an a, a more fuller manifestation of that. The fourth dream of Sri Aurobindo, which he said has already begun, is the spiritual gift of India to the world. Now frankly, as you all know, Asia has been the birthplace of a lot of prophets. All right? Jesus was supposedly born in Asia. Um, many other prophets were born in Asia. The Buddha was born in Asia. Most people we call Hindu prophets were born in Asia. Um, Zarathustra was born in Asia. So Asia has been the birthplace of many prophets. And um, in, in India, for instance, you have this thing which has in fact moved westwards or worldwards, if I may put it that way. In our generation and in our last two generations, the understanding of yoga as a, as a way for a better life, the usefulness of meditation even to improve corporate efficiency, these are things that have been talked about. So when Sri Aurobindo talked about a spiritual gift of India to the world has already begun, you see over the last maybe century and more, many of those things taking root elsewhere in the world. And you will now see that many of those things are being researched in many places in the world. May not be so much in India, but maybe somewhere else in the world. So, now, this is very important because somewhere this is connected to Sri Aurobindo's dream of a political freedom for India. You will remember, we are not talking about that today, that Sri Aurobindo was a freedom fighter. Most people in India know of him as a freedom fighter. So I've taken two quotes, which talks about, one quote is from the, um, from his speech of 15th August. So, and the second one, you will probably guess, is from much before the Uttarpara speech, but the essence has not changed. He says, she does not rise as other countries do for self or when she is strong to trample on the weak. This was his dream, that India will not become another colonizing power. India will not give birth to a Napoleon. Remember Ashoka's empire after, you know, Chand, uh, you know Kala Ashoka, Chanda Ashoka, it became Amma Ashoka. It was an empire of peace. So therefore, India in Sri dream would not be a colonizing power. Somebody who would not, you know, a nation that would not give birth to an emperor who would go with his armies marching all over the world. Not another embodiment of Nazism or I don't know what, any kind of colonization. She is rising to shed the eternal light entrusted to her over the world. India has always existed for humanity and not for herself and it is for humanity and not for herself that she must be great. So in his dream, India's rise is not to benefit the, only the stomachs of 125 crore Indians. It is because India has something to share in, with the rest of humanity and for humanity, for humanity to receive that, India herself must rise. And as you can see, this is from Uttarpara's speech, the second quote. I have given you a work and it is to help to uplift this nation before long the time will come when you will have to go out of jail. So when you say or when people say that this Aurobindo Ghosh became Sri Aurobindo and fled from the freedom movement, I have deliberately juxtaposed these two quotes to say that Sri Aurobindo's vision never changed. His purpose of fighting and struggling for the freedom of India never really changed. What he was saying right from day one was, the political independence of India is important for humanity. And he has mentioned elsewhere that, you know, once he was assured that that progress would happen outwardly even without him, he, lay, he left. He left so that others could come and take the stage. The last dream that Sri Aurobindo talked about was a step in evolution. Can you go back to the first slide for a minute? 
because I'd like to, you to read this. This is fifth dream and it's the longest line. He talks about a step in evolution which would raise man to a higher and larger consciousness and begin the solution of the problems which have perplexed and vexed him since he first began to think and to dream of individual perfection and the perfect society. So the dream of individual perfection is something that has obsessed us right from the beginning. That's why we go for physical exercises, that's why we meditate, that's why we concentrate, that's why we study, that's why we do all the things that we do. It's to achieve individual perfection or in modern parlance, individual excellence. The second thing is, which we've always been in the quest of, and different social and political experiments have worked towards, is the fact is a perfect society. What is that social order which will really be the ideal social order? And I've taken the simplest explanation of this thing from the mother, and you might have actually come across this, particularly junior school teachers, because this is to the children of the Sri Aurobindo Ashram. And she says, there is an ascending evolution. She's explaining the, the concept of evolution in nature, which goes from the stone to the plant, from the plant to the animal, from the animal to man. Because man is, for the moment, the last rung at the summit of the ascending evolution, he considers himself as the final stage in this ascension and believes there can be nothing on earth superior to him. In that he is mistaken. In his physical nature, he is yet almost wholly an animal. That is the reason we mutate. That is the reason we fall sick. That is the reason we die. All right? A thinking and speaking animal, but still an animal in his material habits and instincts. Undoubtedly, nature cannot be satisfied with such an imperfect result. She endeavors to bring out a being who will be to man what man is to the animal. A being who will remain a man in its external form and yet whose consciousness will rise far above the mental and its slavery to ignorance. Repeatedly, Sri the mother has pointed out, this is not the concept of Nietzsche Superman. It's not again that all-powerful man who will kill all around him or subjugate them to rise to power. Rather, one should remember the little essay of Bertrand Russell of knowledge and wisdom. It is a wiser man, all right? And then we, now mother talks about the connection with Sri Aurobindo. Sri Aurobindo came upon earth to teach this truth to man. The fact that we are not the last in evolution. He told them that man is only a transitional being living in a mental consciousness. That's our mind that works the most. But with the possibility of acquiring a new consciousness, because we are a thinking, speaking, dreaming man, the truth consciousness and capable of living a life perfectly harmonious, good and beautiful, happy and fully conscious. During the whole of his life upon earth, Sri Aurobindo gave all his time to establish in himself this consciousness he called supramental and to help those gathered around him to realize it. Now he's, she's saying something which is addressed to Sri Aurobindo Ashram, but possibly can apply also to us. You have the immense privilege, she says, of having come quite young to the ashram. This is definitely true of our children. It may be also true for many of us. That is to say, still plastic and capable of being molded according to this new ideal and thus become the representatives of the new race. Here in the ashram, you are in the most favorable conditions with regard to the environment, the influence, the teaching, and the example, to awaken in you this supramental consciousness and to grow according to its law. And now, 
She puts it like this. Sri Aurobindo, in the conclusion of his speech, said, all depends on this free India. And the mother says, now all depends on your will and your sincerity. If you have the will, no more to belong to ordinary humanity, no more to be merely evolved animals. If your will is to become men of the new race, realizing Sri Aurobindo's supramental ideal, living a new and higher life upon a new earth, you will find here all the necessary help to achieve your purpose. You will profit fully by your stay in the ashram and eventually become living examples for the world. <coughs> right? So, in eight slides, I've tried to compress some monumental thing, which is the vision and the work of Mother and Sri 